Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Marco Russo. I'm here today to talk about uh, how to optimize data models for tabular solutions and power pivot. So just to break the class, uh, how many of you followed the session from Alberto this morning? Almost everybody. And how many of you already used the power pivot? Or tabular? Many of you. Good. I hope you will find uh, useful information today. And uh, the idea is to uh, optimize how you, how you create the data model. Today you have seen uh, with Alberto how to, op to optimize the queries, the DAX queries. Um, now we will see not uh, how to optimize DAX code, but how to optimize the data model. Uh, the columns that you choose, the table that you choose, and the relationships that you create uh, across <coughs> the table. Um, as you will see, um, oftentimes you have to measure things. Uh, we, do not, uh, we cannot say this is better than this other, it always depends on the context. And I will provide you some information to make a uh, uh, good decision. Uh, as I said, I wrote uh, a few books uh, and uh, I wrote articles on SQLBI.com and you can find many, many details about uh, what we are going to say today. This is the agenda for today. There are four main topics. Uh, how data is stored internally in uh, X-Velocity, which is the common engine for power pivot and tabular. Uh, we will see how to optimize compression for storing data in memory. And we will discuss about normalization or denormalization of data when you create a data model in tabular and we will talk about relationships and uh, if you are wondering what is a virtual relationship we will see this later so the first topic is uh, how we can store data how sorry how data is are stored is stored inside uh, x velocity x velocity is the internal engine of uh, power pivot and uh, tabular uh, to tell the truth, is also this engine is also similar to the one used in common store indexes in SQL Server. It is the same code base that has been moved to SQL Server and adapted to SQL Server. And the idea is that we have uh, an in-memory columnar storage database. Data are stored column by column instead of row by row. And data are stored in memory and data are kept in a compressed way. So when you query data, the engine does not have an uncompressed view of the data. It always uses and scans the memory for data that is still compressed. So it is important that this compression is uh, very quick when you have to scan and read. <laughs> so understanding how the compression happens in memory, this uh, will help us understanding how we can provide data that can uh, uh, have a better uh, compression in memory. And if you compress data more, <coughs> you obtain several advantages. First, you spend less uh, RAM, less memory. You can store more data in the same amount of memory. Second, usually you obtain better performance for your query because uh, since the engine has to always scan the data <coughs> for the entire table of the columns that are interested in the query, uh, having the same amount of rows in a smaller amount of memory means that uh, the processor has to uh, access the memory, the RAM, less than uh, if you have uh, a, lower a lower compression. So higher compression <coughs> is usually better for the performance too. So it's a win-win. Data are stored column by column. This means that uh, if you have a table with many columns, each column is stored uh, in a different uh, array in memory. And this array is also optimized, is also compressed, following two main uh, <coughs> techniques. One is called run length encoding, and is the one that uh, is very easy to understand. Imagine that you have a table that has a quarter, products, uh, uh, customer, many columns. <coughs> If you have a column that has a low number of distinct values, the chances that you have the same value in uh, contiguous rows is higher than when you have many distinct values in the same column. 
So for example, you have only four possible values for the quarter. If you have many columns, sorry, many rows that have the same Q1 value, um, this, this, uh, this, uh, uh, the same data can be represented in memory uh, by compressing uh, this uh, uh, duplication, storing the data in a different way. Like we can see here, we can have, uh, for example, the value, the index to we, in which uh, this value starts, and for how many rows this is <coughs> duplicated. Of course, when you have uh, uh, a long list of uh, the value that is always the same, the compression improves. So if you imagine that uh, you sorted the rows by quarter, you obtain the best possible optimization for this algorithm. But you don't have only one column in your table, you have other columns. And you, if you sort data by quarter, you cannot have the same uh, best possible order in another column. So if you consider the next column, product ID, you probably have, even if you sort the data by quarter, product, and other columns, you will have product one, two, three, for the quarter one, and then again for the quarter two, and so on. So probably the table for displaying the product ID in a compressed way will have more rows than the one that we use for the quarter that has only four rows in the best possible scenario. But again, the engine tries to compress data using this algorithm and if the resulting table is smaller than the size of the original column, then the compression is good. If otherwise you have a column that has a different value for each row, making this optimization, making this compression will not compress anything, will, will, will consume more space. And so in this case, the algorithm automatically detects, oh, this column uh, cannot be compressed with, with the round length encoding, so we store this column in this way. At this point, you may wonder, Marco, but if this is true, the, the, the order of the data is relevant, because changing the order of the data that we move into Power Pivot or uh, Analysis Services Tabular, will produce different uh, results in terms of compression. And this is partially true. It is only partially true because in reality, uh, X velocity reads a chunk of data that is 1 million of rows in Power Pivot, 8 million of rows in Tabular. In Tabular, this, this number, 8 million of rows, can be changed in a setting of the analysis services configuration. It reads this amount of rows and tries to sort data, finding, uh, not the best, but uh, a, good, a good sort order for the columns that improves the compression. So up to 8 million rows or up to 1 million rows, you should not see different performance in compression by providing data sorted or not. In reality, the algorithm that tries to detect which is the best sort order, could not find the best possible optimization that you may be able to find if you know your data. And unfortunately, we don't have a rule, because the best possible optimization is uh, something that depends on uh, how data is distributed across uh, the rows uh, of your table. So usually you don't see many differences. For very large tables, it could be better providing data in a sorted way to analysis services or power pivot in order to improve the compression. But this is extreme optimization. We don't want to go there. We just trust our engine and we know that this should be good enough. And usually it is. So this is the first compression that we have. But as I said, we have two main algorithms for the compression. The second one is called <coughs> the dictionary encoding. Regardless, of the content of a column, uh, the value of each possible distinct value is stored into a dictionary. So imagine that you create uh, a list of the distinct values for one column. Now, once you have the dictionary, each value has an index, which is an integer number. And usually you you're used to think that one integer requires 
16 bits or 32 bits or maybe 8 bits. But uh, X velocity can do better. If you have only four distinct values, for example, you only require two bits to store the value for one row. Because in reality, it does not require eight bits. So the number of bits required for the index to the dictionary is automatically detected by the engine on a segment-by-segment -segment basis. So it depends on the number of distinct values you have in each segment. And for very large tables, this makes uh, the sort order outside is more important. Anyway, this uh, contributes to store a lower number of uh, no, bits for each row. Now, the two techniques are combined together so that uh, if you use the dictionary encoding plus the, plus the run length encoding, you obtain a very good compression. And of course, there is much more than that. There are much more details. Many of them are not fully documented by Microsoft. They are, they are under patent. But this is the general idea. And why this is important? Because uh, if you think about the dictionary, if data are stored in this way, is it important to discuss about uh, the data type uh, of a column for a table in X velocity? Yes, but not for the performance, not for the, the amount of storage required. This is a fundamental decision. In SQL, when you decide about uh, integer, big integer, numeric, how, ma how much dig digits in a numeric? Do you want double or single? And you spend time about uh, discussing, can we reduce the data type size because we can optimize data, we can optimize the storage in this way. This discussion is completely over in tabular and power pivot because with the dictionary, the only thing that matters is how many <coughs> distinct values we have in this column. There is, there is nothing else that is relevant. We still have to care about the data type, but not for the compression, because we may want a different semantic if we have sorry. No. <laughs> if we have a if we have a, a column that contains a, a number, we may have different calculation if we have a floating point or, a, or, a, or an integer or a currency, which is a fixed point, not a floating point, just five uh, five digits after the comma. So Five, five decimals. Uh, so the only thing that matters for, uh, for uh, X velocity, the data type is important because of the semantic that we want to give to this column. But we do not spend time discussing about, uh, do, you, do you want to store uh, a, a string here or a number? Do you want to normalize this into a table? It doesn't matter. Because in, in reality, there is an automatic compression, an, an automatic reduction of each column to a list of indexes that points to another table that contains the values. So data are internally, in some way, normalized using this technique. So this, are, this is the X velocity storage engine and how it works. So this, you do not have a, cont a direct control over that. <coughs> the only thing that you can do is try to provide a lower number of distinct values in each column. So, at this point, we can think about, uh, well, what we can do. Uh, as I said, a better compression can uh, produce a better performance, and also, uh, the average compression that we can obtain is something that really depends on your data. A uh, common request that I receive is, uh, Marco, can you, can you help me evaluate uh, what is the, the uh, the size of the server, the size of the RAM that we need for this database. And they provide me a few numbers. How many rows there are in the fact table, in the dimensions, how many tables, uh, how many gigabytes are in the database. And the problem is that it is not enough. Because you have to look at the data, you have to look at the distribution of the data in order to uh, understand what could be the compression. The best thing that they can do is overestimate, sorry, underestimate the compression, so overestimate the RAM required. But usually, uh, you require less memory, especially if you apply some of the optimization techniques that we are, we are going to see 
in the, in the, in the next part of the session. How can you check what is the actual, uh, uh, the actual memory used by your columns of, in your tables? There are a few data management views that allows you to do that, that allows you to get this information. And uh, uh, this, uh, a few of these data management views produce a table that contains many information about uh, the size of each segment of the table, uh, the size of each table in memory, the size of each column. And this data management view produce what? Produce something like that. Let me show you this. This is a table. This is a table that uh, we can obtain <coughs> with a, a single, let me show you, with this, uh, for example, this is uh, the data management view that uh, provides me information about the memory used uh, for every object. And I can look at this table that contains, uh, in this moment, for this instance of analysis services that runs on my laptop, we have 27,000 rows so that we can read once by one, one by one, and spend the entire afternoon on that. Or we can be smarter than that and put all this information into uh, a table, for example in Power Pivot, and then run a pivot table on that, like uh, Casper de Jong uh, did for us, uh, and uh, he published uh, an interesting blog post that uh, shows this uh, pivot table that is connected to analysis services. And fundamentally, I'm looking at uh, what is the distribution of data across my databases on my machine. So as you see, in this moment, I have five gigabytes stored in tabular. And most of these data are stored in the databases. I can see here how much uh, memory is used from, for, for each database in my machine. And once I see, oh, it's interesting, this is a Contoso database that contains a lot of RAM, 700 megabytes. Who is the responsible for this? I can drill down, as you see, uh, data are exposed the, in the multidimensional way, so you still see databases, uh, dimensions, fact tables. In reality, every table you have in tabular corresponds to one dimension in multidimensional. So, when you look at the data for tabular, you have to think that each dimension is a, is a, is a table in, a, in a, our data. And in fact, uh, the names that you see here are all the tables that are included in this database. And for example, you can quickly see that just a few tables contain um, the most of the data. For example, this one, this single table online sales uh, is responsible for one third of the memory. To 145 megabytes. If I drill down here, I can see that the uh, in memory table contains columns and hierarchies. So we have uh, columns, hierarchies, relationships are the three objects in memory that uh, uh, defines each memory in, in tabular. And if you drill down in the columns, you can see that uh, there are several columns and uh, each column is responsible for a certain amount of data. And you can see here that uh, one of the bigger column is the online sales key. Remember, every column has exactly the same number of uh, rows. In this case, there are about 20 million of rows. So there are columns that uh, require uh, pretty much no memory, just uh, 0 0.01 mm. megabyte, 10 kilobytes because probably these columns have a very small number of distinct values. But when you have a large number of distinct values, for example, this column probably contains uh, almost a distinct value for each row, and this is a large column, 32 megabytes. And you see here, sales order line number, another 15 megabytes, and so on. So you can quickly see that uh, a few columns that may be not so important to us are the ones that uh, consume the more <coughs> of the memory. Okay, so this is interesting. This uh, raises uh, some interesting point because if I want to save my memory, I probably have to, to do what? I have to clean up my data, I have to remove something. 
So let's try to see what we can do to improve uh, our data model. So the first suggestion is, uh, the, the first suggestion in reality is obvious. Remove the columns that you don't need. Do you have a column that contains a global unique identifier that is used for the replication of the table across many different servers? Maybe that in SQL Server it is very useful having this column. But do you really need this column in Tabular? Probably not. Remove it. Uh, do you need the timestamp of the last, uh, the very last uh, change in this uh, in this row, in this table for this row, the name of the user that changed in this row, all all of the auditing information that you may have to store in order to you know for security reasons. And we are not required. So the idea is, this column is required for you or not. If it is not uh, required for the analysis, remove it. It will be still stored in SQL Server, but you will remove it from the memory. The second step is, we can try to reduce the number of these values. Now, think about, uh, you have, uh, in SQL Server, you want to store uh, the web log of uh, uh, a website, the, the log of a website from IIS, for example. So you import this data from the log of IIS and you have a timestamp column that contains date and time of each event. Nice. In SQL Server, is a single column that uh, stores data and probably is the most efficient way to represent when the user clicked on the page and something like that. But when you, win, when you want to analyze this data, do you really need to define a, a filter over a range that starts from a certain hour, minute, and, and second today until a certain other hour, minute, and second tomorrow? Probably not. Probably you want to analyze data by date or by time. Or you may want to cross date and time on two different axes. You may want to see, to see the name of the day of the week on the rows, and uh, how are on the columns to see when the workload of your server are higher. The point is that you don't need having this data in a single column. It is much better if you split this column in two different columns, one that contains just the date and one that contains just the time. The point is that in Tabular, you don't have a, a different data type for date and time. You have only one. But if you remove the time part from the date, from the date time, and you keep only the date and you round the, the time to midnight, midnight and you store the, the date in one column. You will use another column for date time, of date time, data type, but you will remove the day and you will keep only the time. In SQL you will double the space, in tabular you reduce the size required because you improve the compression. So this counterintuitive way of data modeling is one of the first rules that you have to learn in Power Pivot and Tabular. Use column that store the information that you need in the smaller uh, amount of space possible. And talking about the time, do you really need the milliseconds? No. Do you really need the seconds? Maybe yes, maybe no. Every time that you remove something, you reduce the number of distinct values. And if you reduce the number of distinct values, you improve the compression. Try with your data and look at what happened when you have something that you can reduce. Another example that I have in the slide, floating point values. If you know, I mean, if, the, if this floating point is the, is the value that you have in a bank account, probably nobody wants to round it in any direction. But if this is the temperature that is, me that is measured outside here in the airport, we know that the sensor that we have may have a precision of, uh, you know, one decimal. Uh, but, uh, but when you receive the floating point, you have a lot of decimals because there is noise in the transmission, I don't know. And so you may have measures that could be rounded without removing value from the, from the number that you read. And in that case, again, you may have uh, a, an improvement by, by rounding the number. I'm not saying that this is always possible. Uh, oftentimes, it, it, it is not. But this is something that you can try to do. So 
you have to do that uh, when you read the data from the data source. It, doing this in a calculated column makes no sense because in order to create a calculated column, you have to keep the original column in the data model and in memory. So you have to do this type of uh, rounding, splitting in a view that you will use as, yeah. as your data source. My suggestion is always do not read the data directly from a table. Always read data from a, from a view, especially if you read from SQL Server, because in this way you create a decoupling layer between uh, uh, analysis services or Power Pivot and the physical table. And it is much easier to change something if you have uh, um, some, if you if you need to change uh, the data model on the relational side or the data model on the tabular side. As I said, um, remove useless columns. And this is another interesting discussion. Where is it to know? I mean, how many of you use uh, uh, the star schema data modeling? Almost everybody. Do you use surrogate keys? Yeah, almost everybody. And this is good. I mean, this is absolutely good. It's the right thing to do. I'm not saying that it, it is wrong. I'm just saying, in tabular, is useless. I will continue to use surrogate keys in SQL. I'm, I'm not going to change my, my star schemas because uh, tabular is just one of the consumer. I could have other consumers. But for tabular, having a surrogate key <coughs> and then having uh, the natural key in the same table means only one thing. I'm consuming, I'm consuming double the space of this column. I do not have, I'm not going to increase the information that I have and I'm, I'm going to waste more space. So if I really want to optimize my data model, if I don't have the surrogate key because I have a slowly changing dimension type 2, in that case the surrogate key is necessary, but when you have a slowly changing dimension type 1, the surrogate key is useless for tabular. So, what we do, if we really need to improve the compression, in order to reduce the number of columns, we expose the application key instead of the survey key in the, in the views that we use to feed our data model. And this means that also the fact table does not have a survey key, have the, the natural key in the view. You may think that this is a smart idea or not, but remember, if my priority is to reduce the size of the data in memory, because I have a constraint, the RAM that I have available, this is one thing, one thing that you could consider. Removing surrogate key and keeping the natural keys. I'm not saying, in many cases, uh, we keep the surrogate keys because uh, we can afford the cost. But, if I have to choose something to remove, this is one of the high in list. Why? Because surrogate keys, especially for dimensions that have a very large number of rows, the customer, the products, in certain business, uh, these keys could be expensive. And having two colors so expensive is more expensive. So these are the, 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 the tables that I think, oh, we, we may think about optimi optimizing that if we need to save memory. Uh, other other op optimizations are very, very, very easy. One is uh, reduce the calculated columns. If you use the calculated columns to, to store intermediate uh, calculation, you have to, to, to create a very complex calculation and you split this calculation in smaller steps. When you are developing, that's fine. But when you go in production and the table in which you apply this technique is very large, hmm, maybe that you can try to create a more complex tax, tax statement, <coughs> reducing the number of, uh, of uh, columns that will be always in memory. Also, if you hide the column to the user, the column will be still in memory. Uh, junk dimensions. In uh, Kimbo, that many of you know, if you have uh, many attributes that have a very low number of distinct values, a good idea is, uh, okay, I create a single table that contains all the possible combination between uh, the five uh, flags, true, false, yes, no, and I store in the fact table only one value that points to this combination of uh, different values. Because in this way, I reduce the number of relationships, I reduce the number of tables, and so on. 
that's fine, but uh, in reality, the normalizing this uh, table into the fact table could be, could be, not necessarily will be, but could be uh, an advantage in uh, memory. And we will see some example later. If you have a column, uh, the online sales that you have seen before, uh, if you remember, I have shown you here uh, that one of the most expensive columns is this sales order number. Sales order number is a column that uh, is responsible for a huge amount of RAM, 62 megabytes in a table that, uh, that uh, requires uh, 250 megabytes. So is 25% uh, or more, 30% of the size of the table. If I remove this single column, I will save a lot of space. The problem is why I keep this column in uh, my table because probably I need it. Why I need the sales order number? Probably not because I want to group data, group, group sales by a single sales order number. This is not usually the reason. The reason is that at a certain point, uh, my user says, oh, I see a strange number here. Please give me the list of the invoice numbers. I want to check what happened here. So the real reason for which we want to keep track of something that allows me to get the original document in my, in my fact table is that uh, uh, I want to be able to track, the, to, to track data uh, down to the OLTP. Now, if this is the need that you have, do you really need to, to store this uh, information in this way? Not necessarily. I may store the same information in another way storing less, uh, less uh, I mean, improving the optimization. And what is the technique? The idea is that uh, if I really need to store this uh, information for the drill-through operation, when you, when you are in a pivot table like this one, you want to double-click here and look at the list of the transactions in which one column is a sales order number. When you want to do that, the drill-through is this feature, even if the number is not in a single column, but for example, is split in two columns or three columns, you may obtain the same information, just require you have to merge the two columns, but uh, fundamentally you obtain the same information, but you could improve the, the performance. But of course, the optimization that I'm going to show now uh, could be very bad if you want to apply a distinct count calculation on, on these two, uh, on this number. You want to know how many, dis how many different uh, <coughs> uh, documents I produced in this month. Okay, for this reason I will need this, this column. If this is fundamental for your business, this optimization is not going to, to, to improve the performance. So one idea is, is the transaction, if the transaction ID is a string, we may split this string in two parts. Uh, five and five, but in reality it could be three and, 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 and seven. It depends on the distribution of data. We should try to find a way to split the, the data in a way that if we had one million of distinct values at the beginning, we will obtain 1,000 distinct values and 1,000 distinct values in two columns. Because the combination of this uh, information will, will produce the original one million of distinct values. If you have a, a standard distribution here, this could be an idea. Mm, another idea is imagine that you have 100 million of values in one column. You have all the IDs from 1 to 100 millions. Storing this data in a single column requires 100 million distinct values. But if you store the same information into two numbers, one that contains uh, the, the module to 10,000 and the other, uh, the rest of the division. So you will obtain uh, two numbers that uh, combine together. So if you multiply transaction high ID by 10,000 and you sum transaction low ID, you obtain the original number. But storing the data in this way can save a lot of space. When I say a lot, usually I mean some order of magnitude. You will never you will never hear me saying a lot, meaning 10% or 20%. When I say a lot, it means at least 100%, but sometimes much more. Let's see what happens when we have this scenario. So 
Just to show you an example, and not to bore too much you with the slides, we have here this uh, number 02 uh, database, uh, uh, and we also have, uh, let, me, let me restore the, the database uh, that I forgot to restore before. Uh, no, this way. I don't have to do it. Sorry. Maybe this one. If otherwise. Okay, not here. Sorry. Anyway, we can see this here. This uh, table contains uh, a numbers table. Uh, this uh, numbers table is fundamentally a table that contains uh, 100 million of rows. And originally it was a single column with all the numbers from 1 to 100 millions. If I write a simple while it row x count rows of my table numbers, this is a simple tax statement that shows me that I have 100 million rows here. This is the number I have. Now, in reality, if we look at the structure of this table, we have two columns. Number one, number two. Number one is uh, numbers, num one. This is, uh, oops, what's that? Oh, yes, I had to write the values. And that's all. I have 10,001 rows, I have one more. And the same for num2. So fundamentally, if we, uh, if we query this, uh, this table, we will see that we have all the combination between all the numbers. So at the end, we have 100 million of rows. Now, how much is important this optimization? Let's take a look at the next slide. The original table that had only one column with all the numbers would, uh, would be in memory, would consume in memory uh, 763 megabytes. And on this would be much larger. This is because uh, internal storage uh, <coughs> is, is different. But uh, fundamentally, when we applied this optimization uh, to columns, we reduced the size to uh, less than 200 megabytes. So it's one third of the original sites in memory and one tenth of the original sites on disk. So as you can see, this optimization is very important. But everything has a cost. The cost here is that uh, uh, when you process the table, you have to consume much more CPU. Not a big trouble because uh, usually this is uh, done uh, in, during the night, but uh, you have to consider that, that if you have uh, other workload on your system. And as you can see, you can also further optimize uh, splitting <coughs> the column in more columns, because fundamentally we obtain more columns with a lower number of distinct values. Of course, this is a, not a realistic scenario, because we have a perfect distribution of data in this case. Usually this is not true. Um, but uh, it is just to make you aware of the different way of thinking in Tabular. If you want to optimize data, you can always do something, but you have to pay the price for that. For example, in this case, the price to pay is that if you, if you write uh, distinct count of uh, numbers num1, this is pretty quick. I run this and I obtain the, the answer in less than one second. And this would be the same if I had 100 million of rows in the, in the single column. But if I want to uh, generate uh, the original value, uh, I want to count uh, uh, the number of rows uh, of the distinct combination between number one and number two, I should write something like that. So I, I should uh, materialize the original uh, number of rows, and this is one option, and another is creating a temporary table with uh, the, the result of number one multiplied by blah blah blah, but also doing this uh, simple example, you can see that one very bad thing is happening now. Oh, let me see. Uh, open task manager, hopefully. Yes. And you can see here what is happening. I have uh, my... Oh, sorry. This is not happening. Anything? Uh, 
one, two, three, one, two, three. Okay. Oh, okay. Now it's running. Now that this query is running, as you see, my CPU is going very high. I have all the cores working and my memory is increasing. What's happening? Uh, we are materializing the original table in an uncompressed way in memory. And this is very expensive. And uh, I will stop this query, but uh, it usually returns in a couple of minutes. And uh, after exploding the RAM in more than a few gigabytes of RAM. So, as you see, everything has a price. In this case, the price is that I don't need the distinct count on the original column. But if this is just for the drill through, it could be good. I will hide any measure based on this column anyway, probably. Okay, so we can go back to the slide. Another very interesting, very interesting uh, consideration is about, uh, uh, is about uh, what to store in the cube. If you are used to the multidimensional, if you have this uh, scenario, what you will store in the cube? The, we have order ID. I, I just uh, increase the size, maybe not everyone read. Order ID, product ID. I need this, uh, sort, these keys because they connect uh, the fact table to the dimensions. I need them. Then I have quantity, price, discount, and sales amount. Which column you would store in multidimensional? Quantity? Yes? No? I don't see. Yeah. Is a, is a, we can aggregate on quantity, yes. It's, it's a good measure. Yeah. Price. Will you store the price column in multidimensional? You are not using multidimensional? <laughs> Okay, will you store sales amount? Sales amount, yes, because it's the quantity by price. And we store sales amount, we store quantity. We could store price, but we cannot sum price. We could uh, just create an average measure for price. The point is that in multidimensional, we usually store quantity and sales amount because we can obtain price as the division by sales amount and quantity, and the rule in multidimensional is store the measure that can be aggregated with a sum. Quantity can be aggregated with a sum, yes. Sales amount, yes. Price, no. We don't store price. We may store discount, but this is out of scope now. So, what if we do the same in tabular? I'm saying this because it could be not a good idea. The keys are required we will store them. Quantity, price, and discount have a small number of distinct values. They are good. But the problem is that uh, the sales amount column usually has the higher cardinality. Consider this. If you have 100 different values in the quantity column, 100 different values in the price column, how many distinct values you will have in sales amount? You can guess. Many? Many is a good answer. <laughs> okay, we can have a, a minimum and a maximum. We don't know how many. What is the minimum? You have 100 distinct values in the quantity, 100 distinct values in price. You calculate the multiplication of these two numbers. How many distinct values you can have in sales amount? I, I, I answered in the wrong way the first time. How many? Let's try. Give me a number, guys. 1, 10, 100, 10,000, 1 million. Okay. The, the common answer is, if I have 100 distinct values in two columns, the result of the product will be any number between 100 and 10,000. And unfortunately, the answer is wrong. And I made the same answer at the first because one day someone said that no, from a mathematical point of view, you can have only one value in sales amount. 
Because you can have different combinations of values that uh, multiplied together will produce always the same number. It, it can be possible. Then I say, you are right. From a mathematical, mathematical point of view, you are right. I'm wrong. From a statistical point of view, I'm absolutely correct. And probably, the number is more towards the minimum or the maximum. In a regular distribution, it is toward the maximum. It's probably more towards 1,000 and 10,000 than towards 100. <coughs> because the data, the distribution of data, usually, usually is done in this way. And the problem is that we have to think, I would, I would like to, uh, to make you think about, uh, you faced a problem, a statistical problem that probably you faced many years ago. And then you discharge it because you, you, don't, you never need a game in your daily job. Probably at school, you were able to answer to my initial question, but nobody answered it. Why? Because you are not used to think about in this term. Now you have to start again thinking about uh, statistical distribution. Because this matters now. And this is a problem because we are not used to it. So sales amount uh, is more expensive, so we can remove this column and we can calculate this column on the fly at query time. It will be faster than storing the actual column in memory. It is not less <coughs> expensive. Sometimes it is also faster. And we have some example of that. Uh, the idea is that uh, we can obtain uh, the value of sales amount in this way. Sum x table quantity multiplied by price. If you look at this, you say, oh, but you are scanning the entire table and you are multiplying these two columns? Yes. It is much faster than this, than having a single column with the data already stored. Why? Because uh, we have less memory to scan and because the algorithm is very optimized. And you have to think about accessing data to the memory is a bottleneck exactly like the I.O. on disk. Imagine. In SQL, what you want to do is reducing the number of I.O. Well, now in tabular, what you want to avoid is access to the RAM. And uh, if we had... Uh, the database that uh, Alberto shown this morning has uh, 4 billion of rows, and uh, one single column was 9 gigabytes stored in memory, but this column was obtained by a multiplication. And uh, a query on this column spent 13 seconds, and the column was stored in 9 gigabytes. When we made this optimization, we obtained what? We obtained on the same table, we calculated this column on the fly, we saved, uh, um, we saved a lot of space because we fundamentally removed the uh, a column that was redundant because we stored all the three calls and the query runs in three seconds, four times faster because we reduced the number of uh, access to the run. And that's it. And I know that is strange, but uh, sometime after a while you will, be, you will get used to that. So, next step. So the general idea is, okay, we have to reduce the columns we have to keep the columns that have the lower number of distinct values. Easy. Now, usually we don't have only one table. We have many tables. And we may uh, think, okay, the star schema is good. The star schema is good. For tabular, is very good. <coughs> but sometimes we don't have a star schema. Sometimes we have a doubt. Should we normalize? Should we approach a... a should we choose, choose an approach that is more normalized or more denormalized? Because every time we create another table in tabular, we add an object in memory that is a relationship. The relationship is not for free. The relationship has a cost. And here, we are not longer in black and white scenario. There are many grays, because uh, you, you have to test every time. I, I know that uh, it is hard to, to say what is better. Let's see an example. We have um, a table that contains uh, a few data, uh, like quantity price, sales amount. But we want, to, we want to segment the data so that uh, each uh, row in the sales table will be classified in a cluster. 
which is uh, very low, low, medium, high, very high, based on the price we had in this transaction. So we want to uh, segment the, da the data based on the price. How can we do that? One way is, okay, we can create a table with this information that uh, defines which are our segments, uh, which are the boundaries of each segment, and uh, we can we have two choices now. We can create a relationship, creating one calculated column and a relationship that connects each row of the fact table with the corresponding row in the segments table. One approach. This has a cost of what? We have to spend the space for one column, one calculated column, and we have to spend the cost for the relationship that connects the two tables. The alternative <coughs> is uh, denormalize. We could just copy the data that we need in the fact table. <coughs> because uh, just like we created the, 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 the code the column, we could create the segment column. And we keep the code the column only because we want to sort the segment column by the code column. Otherwise, I could, I could keep the segment column. The cost for storing each of these two columns is very low because every column has only five distinct values. So the cost is minimal. What is better? Um, before considering the performance and the memory, we have to consider the usability. When you create a different table, the end user that uh, queried the data model will see two different entities the sales and the segments. If you denormalize, you will increase <coughs> the number of attributes of the sales table, which could be exactly what you want or not. I don't know. If you, if you think that it is a good idea to add columns to the fact table that will be used to filter data, not to create uh, measures, then you could create a folder uh, to group the columns that you do not want to, to show to the user at the same level of other columns that represent measures, for example. So this is an advanced uh, uh, tabular optimization, but uh, if you want to do that, uh, you need to install Bits Helper in Visual Studio. This is possible only in tabular. This is possible <coughs> only if you have Bits Helper in Visual Studio, because uh, uh, organizing attributes in folder is not supported by Visual Studio, but is supported by the data model in Tabular. Bits Helper allows you to change the properties if you want. So I close this. This is not part of the discussion, but uh, it's an interesting consideration. So, okay, so there is a, a usability problem that is very important. What about the performance and the size? Well, the size is easy. The denormalized model usually costs more just because uh, you have to increase the number of columns. And every column has a cost. The relationship, I thought at the beginning that the relationship could have been <coughs> so expensive that uh, would not justify um, norm the normalization by itself. In reality, it depends. In this case, with just five values in the lookup table, in the segments table, the cost of the relationship is minimal. As you see, the normalized column shows you the cost of the additional columns and objects that I created for approaching the normalized scenario. Whereas the denormalized scenario has just the cost of the new columns in the fact table, but we don't have relationship uh, uh, to create. Uh, these numbers will change according to the number of rows you have in the fact tables and the number of distinct values you have in the lookup table. So don't take for granted that these are the same values that you will obtain. It depends. But uh, the point is that uh, even if the denormalized approach seems more expensive, sometimes it is better because it could be faster. Usually, Having more tables in a query index is more expensive than having a single table. So when you denormalize, you obtain a simpler join in the VertiPack engine, and you could save time at the query, uh, during the query. So 
It is not a white and black, as I say. I, I cannot say this is better than the other. It depends. But I know that uh, usually uh, a certain denormalization is usually better. But you should test because sometimes the normalization could be too much expensive, especially if you add many columns. If it is just one or two, probably, probably from the performance point of view, it could be better to keep the normalization. So this is uh, what you could, uh, just to, to, to sum up what we said about this topic, uh, we could say that uh, you should denormalize when you have uh, only one column. But in reality, uh, the denormalization is also very good if you have to create a filter over a specific value of the column. In that case, it's absolutely better to use the denormalization instead of uh, the normalization, because the, no the normalization, if you use the relationship and then apply a filter over the lookup table that has to filter the fact table, <coughs> what you usually will do, this could be very expensive. If the condition that you use for the filter is not an equal to, but is a greater than, less than or equal to, between, <coughs> something like that, something more complex, then it is through the contrary. It is better having the lookup table with a small number of rows because in this way, uh, the way the engine works uh, will be more uh, efficient. However, as always, you have to try, you have to test. As you, as you understand, there are too many variables. The number of distinct values, the type of filter that we, you will apply, the type of query you will run, too many variables. If you look about, if you only consider the performance, it is very complex. If you only consider the size in memory, it is easier because you can measure that uh, and this will not change. Performance depends on too many things. So always check size and performance, especially for very large tables. Don't take for granted that this is the true and you have to always do what is written in this slide. This is not true. Last topic, physical and virtual relationships. Uh, what is a virtual relationship? Imagine this scenario. So let's start with a more interesting uh, scenario. We have the, st the classical star schema, sales by customer, date, and product. But at a certain point, we have the budget. And the budget is uh, defined in an Excel table or in a table that is not in Excel in this way. Budget, year, category, and budget date. Now, the problem is that uh, in our data, we have uh, products, and not only category, we have days, months, and not only years. So we have, to, we have the budget, but the granularity is different. The granularity is different. Now, this is not a problem in multidimensional, because in multidimensional, handling data in different granularity is, 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 is something that is absolutely handled by the data model. But in tabular, in tabular you can, hold, you can only define one to many relationships, and we have to create a relationship that is this one. That is a relationship between, let me highlight this, the year here and the year here. But the problem is that the year in the date table is not a unique key. We cannot create a relationship here. It's a virtual relationship. How can we solve this? from the data modeling point of view. There are two approaches. One is, okay, let's move this virtual relationship into a physical one. You can create two tables, years and categories. You can create a one-to-many relationship between categories and products and between categories and budget. Another one-to-many relationship between years and budget and years and, uh, and date. And, uh, sorry, the the line here is probably the contrary. I just realized that this error is in the wrong side. This is the right side of the relationship. Sorry for this mistake. And uh, in this way, when you have this scenario, you, when you filter one year in the years table, you are filtering both the budget and the sales. And this makes the, the model working. But even if you do that, you still have to allocate the value of the budget for one year to the months, to the days, to the products. Because otherwise the budget will be only at a certain level, okay? So in any case, 
I'm going to create uh, some DAX calculation to perform the allocation of the budget. Unless you say, okay, but Marco, it is okay to me to see the budget only at the year level, at the categories level. I never found a customer like that, but maybe that you have. Usually the customers say, oh, okay, I define the budget, now I'll allocate the budget for every product, for every month, for everything. Now, how you, do you perform the budget allocation? This algorithm could be very different. I choose one, but uh, every business has his own rules. And in this case, we just split the budget according to the actual value that we have. So if we have sold one product uh, three more times than another one, the budget will be split in the same way. You could have this split uh, done uh, using the value of the previous year or something like that, I don't know. But uh, you could just change the, the calculate statement that you see in the second part of this SUMX. So I'm not going to, 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 to talk too much about the allocation algorithm in that. So this is uh, something that we will publish in, a, in an article maybe later. But the point is that uh, how do you handle that in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the two ways. So, sorry. This is a, an approach that uh, performs the calculation. As you see, we have uh, the need of defining sales amount, actual value, and budget calc. The actual value could be obtained in this way. This is the actual value for a certain year and category. And so this all except <coughs> removes the filter for getting the data at the right level because we have to get the sales amount for the corresponding level of the, of the, of the budget. And uh, this is the different uh, calculation to create the budget count, which is the, the final part of the calculation that we need. I just want to show you the result uh, because uh, talking about this in theory is very hard. So it is better if I show you uh, I have this one here. So budget uh, physical relationship, just uh, open this <coughs> one. And this is uh, a budget on Contoso. This is, uh, as you see, is almost uh, 300 megabytes of uh, Excel file that has to be loaded in memory. So it requires a few seconds. <coughs> As soon as I have this, I want to show you how the budget works. So fundamentally, we have this budget here. This is the budget that we defined. And in the pivot table, as you see, we want to see that the, the budget value here is the original budget for the audio category and for all the genders of the customers, because we, we put the gender on the columns. So fundamentally, this is the original budget value. and we split this budget across the gender, the category, the, the products, and so on. And the formula that you have seen before perform this calculation. Now, this formula has to do some calculation. The critical one is getting the one part of the budget that has to be allocated. And so, the denominator that you see here, budget calc, sorry, the, the, the part that you see there, budget calc. It's the budget calc is the give me the corresponding budget for this point in the pivot table. And I multiply, I multiply this for the fraction of the sales amount against the, the total value of the sales for the same period, for the same granularity of the budget. Now, this calculation, when you have uh, the relationships, is very easy. Look, this is what you need to write if you want to get the corresponding budget for that period. Because you have the physical relationship, there is an internal DAX behavior that propagates the relationship between online sales and the other tables, and you obtain the right number. So you, we solve the problem by using the data model and reducing the DAX complexity in this way. But if you don't have the relationships, it doesn't matter. DAX allows you to join two tables even if you don't have a relationship. Of course, the DAX code is much more complex, and I'm, I'm not going to, sh to explain you how it works. And I want just to show you that it, it is possible to create the filter conditions that fundamentally emulates the two joints that we don't have in the data model. Why I'm showing all this complex thing? Because I want to consider the performance. Everybody, everybody will say that the physical relationship is faster. And unfortunately, in this data model, it is not true. We cannot say that this will be always true. 
because in reality, the complexity is made by the entire calculation. And in the, if you consider <coughs> the, the entire problem, this type of problem does not have a better solution with a data model that has uh, more tables. But you may find other scenarios, I have seen other scenarios, in which the opposite was true. Creating a couple of tables improved the performance, simplifying the DAX code. But uh, I wanted to show you the counterintuitive example, because I wanted to transmit the message. Uh, don't think about, uh, oh, this will be faster. If you have a lot of experience in Tabular, you may have some ideas. But if you don't have, like many of us don't have, I, myself, I, don't, I still don't have so much experience, just a couple of years, then uh, make some proof of concept, make some test. Because this is strange. The physical uh, model, the, the model based on physical relationships, is, uh, one, is 30, 40% slower, slower than the one that is based on this very complex and long DAX code. Because at the end, we want to execute this, uh, this query that produces uh, something like the pivot table that I showed you before. So, we can avoid creating physical relationships, but even if it is possible, we will save memory. This is true, because we will save relationships tables. This time, we also save the time in performance, but this is not always true. Thank you very much. I think we are out of time, probably. And uh, so if you have any question, I'm here for, to answer. Thank you very much. Thank you.